This is your reality check. Hey Checkers, producer Pat here. We have a regular show for you this week. It'll be out in a couple of days, but there was a lot of news yesterday about the imaging of a black hole. And so Christina and I gave a call to our favorite astronomer, Dr. Stuart Robbins, to talk about that news. And so we thought we'd put that out as a little extra content this week. A note about this, we caught Stuart by phone at his home in Colorado and there was a bit of a storm. And so the audio quality takes a bit of a hit in a few spots, but I think it's still quite listenable. Hope you enjoy it. So Stuart, when we're recording this on April 10th, 2019, there are a number of headlines that have said essentially, quote, we have the first image of a black hole. So what is this all about? This was a massive collaboration by a lot of scientists all over the world, a lot of different institutions all over the world, a lot of different funding organizations all over the world, and a lot of different telescopes all over the world in order to try to image something in radio waves smaller than we've ever been able to image in radio waves before. And what they were able to do through this collaboration was to effectively image a black hole. And the the reason I use the word image is because this was done in radio waves, and radio astronomy is not like optical light astronomy, So with optical light astronomy, we have something like a CCD, which is an array of pixels. And so you can uh, can get an image that is what we're used to. But with radio astronomy, it's a single pixel. And you're really sort of moving your telescope, which is a single pixel across the sky, and then doing a lot of math in order to try to then process that data and figure out exactly what the luminosity of what it is you looked at is at any given location in the sky. And so it's not really obvious how you get from that to a picture that we're used to. And so it's, it's a complicated topic, but uh, that is sort of what the news is all about. Honestly, from your perspective, is this significant? So um, when you initially asked me this question, I was hesitant and said, this is an important next step, but to me, it doesn't seem groundbreaking. And that's because the technology to do this is something that we already basically had. They used uh, what's called uh, very long baseline interferometry in order to link these telescopes together in order to create a picture, effectively, uh, with more angular resolution, so able to see smaller stuff than we were able to do before, but it's sort of uh, an incremental kind of thing for that technology. It's not specifically new. Now, what is new is that they had to modify the method that they were using before, and that's because they were observing at wavelengths that are harder to do for this kind of technique. Uh, They were only able to actually combine the data from all these telescopes with atomic clocks. Uh, They were only able to do this with modern computers that they wouldn't really have been able to do this a decade ago. And this is the first time that we've been able to resolve an accretion disk around the black hole and see what all the press releases are calling a shadow of a black hole on that accretion disk. So effectively, we're seeing a donut. And the hole in the middle is where that black hole is, although it's about two and a half times smaller than that blackness actually is in the picture. So, sir, what does this validate outside of general relativity, which we already knew about? But what what is the significance of this? I mean, for me, the fact that there is an image is probably important for a lot of um, people who aren't in you know, science fields, but outside of that, what is the importance of this or what does it validate? Uh, So you're right. It does validate general relativity. It also validates and rules out some kinds of models for black holes. So what they did when they built up this picture is they then compared it to a lot of different models for 
how they think black holes interact with their environment, depending on how strong the magnetic field is, how fast stuff is rotating around it, how fast it's rotating, the type of environment it's in in terms of what else is around it, all of this different stuff. And they were able to use those different models and compare that to the data to figure out what they're actually looking at and figure out what models actually work. So um, I'll actually quote first paper about this subject because uh, today with the press release, there were six papers released in the Astronomical Journal about this topic. So the first paper ends their abstract by saying that this presents a new tool to explore gravity in its most extreme limit and on a mass scale that was so far not accessible. And the reason why it's mass scale that wasn't accessible before is because we could look at galaxies. Galaxies are big. Galaxies uh, have a lot of mass. Black holes are also big, but they're a lot smaller than galaxies. And so we're able to now uh, resolve and probe these kinds of objects and this kind of phenomenon and really test our models and see what we can tell us. So, Stuart, you mentioned that the paper suggests this is a first step. So from your perspective, what would be the next step? if there is one. So I think that the next step is going to be to turn this kind of array, because it was an array of eight telescopes, to try to look at other places where we think there are black holes. And uh, they're actually planning on adding more telescopes to this, which will make the data processing even harder, but potentially be able to resolve even smaller things on the sky. And so we'll be able to build up a library of these imaged black holes and learn more about, well, to use a term from biology, we'll be able to learn more about the zoology of black holes in the universe by doing this kind of stuff. So, Stuart, lastly, how big is this? How far away is it? And aren't we kind of really looking into history? Right. So anytime you look at anything, you're looking back in time. Um, if you're on Earth, looking at stuff on Earth, the back in time you're looking at is less than a tenth of a second, uh, but you're still looking back in time. In this case, uh, this black hole is about 16.8 megaparsecs away, which in English is about 55 million light years away. So that means we are looking at what it looked like 55 million years ago, and about 10 million years after the death of the dinosaurs. Uh, the object itself weighs in at about six and a half billion times the mass of the sun. So it is uh, a bit heavy, as we might like to say. Um, but again, it's smaller than the mass of a galaxy or uh, smaller than the mass of our galaxy, which is estimated to have uh, somewhere around 200 to uh, 300 or 400 billion solar masses worth of material. So that's how far away it is. That's how massive it is. In terms of physical size, the estimate is that it's about two and a half times smaller than the shadow that we see, that dark area, which is about 40 billion kilometers across. Uh, just to give you a sense of scale, Pluto orbits the sun at about six billion kilometers. So this is 40 versus six, which if I can do quick math in my head, means that it's about eight times the size of Pluto's orbit around the sun. And that's the event horizon. That's the point at which light uh, no longer can escape the gravitational pull of the black hole uh, because in order to escape it, it would have to travel faster than the speed of light. And something that uh, we haven't mentioned yet that I think is important is what the heck does it mean that we're seeing the shadow of the black hole? And I was trying to figure out what they actually meant. This is, uh, it all actually has to do with general relativity again. So we can't actually see the event horizon. We would like to think that space is flat, and so it would be easy, and we put, if we plot it down on graph paper, that's what we would see. But the graph paper is squeezed because of the mass of the black hole. We can't actually see farther in because of general relativity itself, and that's why the press releases and the scientists are all saying that this is the shadow of the black hole. So, Stuart, thanks so much for taking a few minutes. We know that you're really busy. Looking forward to seeing you when you uh, come to town in a couple of weeks. 
Yeah, and hopefully when I'm there, we'll get better audio quality. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, right. Stuart. Thanks, Stuart. For show notes or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at trc underscore podcast. Thank mm-hmm. you.